Does anybody here remember back when there was a little bracelet that people wore and sometimes still do, and it said WWJD? Does anybody know what that stands for? What would Jesus do? Who said that? You got it right there, Dennis. You the man. What would Jesus do? Well, perhaps you, you don't know where that came from. The history of that is in 1896, a pastor by the name of Charles Sheldon wrote a book, and it was called In His Steps. I've seen the book. I think I may have the book. As a matter of fact, more than 30 million copies of that book were sold. 30 million. That's a lot of books. And in that book, he, let, he literally talked about small town living. And uh, he talked about what people would do in this particular place of small town in certain situations. And it came in that town, it, it became a, a question when there were situations that arose and they would say, what would Jesus do? For some reason, it was resurrected back 20, 25 years ago. And uh, there, were, there were little bracelets and people wore pins and it was on bumper stickers. And you could see the phrase, what would Jesus do? Well, we're not going to talk about what Jesus would do because that could cover a vast amount of territory. But what we are going to talk about for the next four Wednesday nights, including this one, we're going to talk about what would Jesus undo. Somebody say, what would Jesus undo? So, so we know what he'll do. He'll save us. He'll heal us. He'll keep us. He's a wonderful counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace, everlasting Father, bread when we're hungry, water when we're th- We know what all he does, but we're going to talk about what he would like to undo. Amen. Have you ever bought a gift for somebody and they acted like it was no big deal and you put a lot of time and effort and uh, maybe went out of your way, maybe spent a lot of money? And, uh, you know, we're living in the most unthankful. The Bible said that's a sign of the end time, to be unthankful. And, and you, you know, you slide something, uh, a gift to somebody at Christmas or on their birthday or some special occasion. I, I heard a story of a man that said that, he, he had a friend that lived in another city, and he was going to see him, and this man had had influence in his life, and so he, he searched. He did some research, found what the man liked and, or thought he liked, and he was a hero to this guy. Well, he went and spent a lot of money and bought a gift, wrapped it up, took it with him, walked into his office, and, and they were talking, and he just slid the gift across the table, and the man just kind of took it and put it aside, didn't open it right then. And it kind of hurt the guy's feelings, and he thought, well, you know, I mean, come on now. I've invested a whole lot here. I've, <laughs> this is my money, my time, my research, and, you know, you're going to slide it to the side. He said he, said he left that day. The, the guy left, and he left, and the next day they came back to that same place, and guess what was sitting there un- unopened? The same gift. Well, it hurt, it hurt the guy's feelings because he had provided a gift And was anticipating the joy that this man would have when he opened the gift. And this man didn't even hardly acknowledge the gift. So, with all of that said, let me say this to you. Jesus Christ must be saying, after almost 2,000 years or about 2,000 years, after he gave his life on Calvary. The the song says he left the splendor of glory. He left the ivory palaces of another world. And he came and he gave his very best. He shed his own blood. He was beaten with a whip. He took a crown of thorns in his head. He took a sword in his side. He took nails through his hands and through his feet. He gave everything that he had for you and for I. Imagine, imagine what he had to give up to endure the cross. But the Bible said he did it with joy. (laughs) You know what we got? We got forgiveness of sin. We got the atonement of the blood. We got life to the fullest extent. The Bible said he's going to give you, he said, I'm going to give you life more abundant. He's going to give us abundant life. We got the Word of God at our fingertips. 
We have access to the very throne of God through prayer in our lives. We are charged with spiritual purpose and we have We have the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ inside of us. It's all because he gave, the Bible said, for God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his only son so that you and I could experience what we know. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful tonight for the cross, and I'm thankful for Calvary's heel. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus. I'm thankful for nail prints in his hands. I'm thankful for the stripes on his back that the healing of our bodies came from. I'm thankful for that. And yet, just hold on now, and yet we go day in and day out without Jesus or the cross, or the sacrifice crossing our minds. I wonder if we're really thankful. So, what would Jesus undo? Here's the first thing we want to talk about. He would undo spiritual indifference in 2021. Spiritual indifference. This is not new to our generation. This is who we have become, spiritually indifferent. Oh, I hope I make you a little bit uncomfortable tonight. I want to preach with love, but I want to preach truth. And when I was studying for this tonight and and I was praying today, God convicted me. So I'm a convicted man preaching to, I hope, convicted people because we need not be spiritually indifferent. There's a problem with that with God. Amen. This is the, one fellow said, the meh generation. How you doing? Meh. Going to church? Meh. How's your prayer life? Meh. Come on now. People shrug it off. Paying your tithes? Meh. You want anybody to God? Meh. The mad generation, kind of a I don't care spirit. Well, let me read you a little bit of something or talk a little bit about uh, a letter that Jesus wrote. He wrote to seven churches in the book of Revelation, seven powerful letters, if you go read them, to different churches. One of them is found in Revelation chapter 3. It's a letter to a church called Laodicea, Laodicea, one of the wealthy cities 35 years earlier, it had been destroyed by an earthquake, and they rebuilt Laodicea. I was there. You were there, Doris. We went. You were there, Don and Charlie. We went to Laodicea. When they rebuilt, they rebuilt with splendor. It had theaters and stadiums and lavish public baths and shopping centers. One one writer or or one preacher said it was like the modern-day Dubai or Las Vegas. It was, uh, it, was, it was quite an elaborate place, but they had one major problem. Y'all will remember this, the guide telling us about it. They had inadequate water supply because there was no water. They built aqueducts to pipe water in from Colossae and Heropolis. Colossae was in the mountainside. And there was cold water. Remember that spring? Cold water that came out of the mountain and ran down to Laodicea. But from from Heropolis came hot water. Hot, so hot that it was steaming. And it would run down also. It was cool. The water was from from, uh, Colossae was cool and refreshing. But the water from Heropolis was hot. It was medicinal it was but by the time they met and they 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 both reached Laodicea it was dirty and it was lukewarm it was not something good and so what we fail to understand when we read of the letter to the Laodiceans is that Jesus was likening something in their life that they could grasp 
they could understand because they knew about the cool water and the hot water meeting in Laodicea and becoming, becoming lukewarm and dirty and tepid. They knew about this. And so Jesus said them, he said this in the 15th verse, and I'm, I'm reading not from the King James, from another translation. It says, I know your deeds. You can put the King James if you want to. But he said, I know your deeds that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. He said, I wish you would, was either cold or hot, what Jesus said. So, he said, because you are lukewarm and you're neither hot nor cold, he said, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. I'm about to spit out. You ever had a good drink of lukewarm water? It'll make you do that. I like the cool, refreshing water out of the refrigerator myself. But he said, because it's lukewarm. In other words, you understand, Laodicea, the water that I'm talking about. But because you are lukewarm and you're not hot and you're not cold, he said, I'm about to spit you out. He, what the translation of the King James says, I will spew you out of my mouth. Here's what Jesus was really saying to those people at Laodicea. He said, you're spiritually stale. You're depressingly detached. Doesn't, you, 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 you don't have it together, although you think you do. And it doesn't just break my heart. It turns my stomach. Because literally, if you want to get right down to it, the Lord said, when he said, I'm going to spit you out, that's what you do when you vomit. It's going to get quiet in here, isn't it? What would Jesus undo? He was upset with Laodicea. There's two causes of spiritual indifference. Listen to me very carefully. You have your sheets there. You will find this. The first one is self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency. Because here's what Laodicea said in the 17th verse. They said, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. We don't need one thing. But you don't realize, the Lord said, that you're really not rich. You are pitiful and wretched and poor and blind and naked. you got a false self-deficiency. You think you got it, but you don't have it. Let me tell you something. It's not enough to go to church. It's not enough to call yourself a Christian. It's not enough just to pay your tithes. It's not enough just to show up on Sunday morning. We have to sell out to God. And our problem in the 21st century is we are living, I know you don't want to hear this, but we are living the most uncommitted age that I've ever seen in my lifetime. And I, I, I'm not far off of three score and ten years but just let me preach to you for a minute we cannot afford in the last day to be indifferent to the things of God we have to plug into God and get on fire and full of the Holy Ghost <coughs> somebody said amen it's the mad generation well you don't understand preacher I got I got my coffee and you know I've heard people say this. Don't say this around me because I don't like it. It's pretty nice staying home now and drinking my coffee on Sunday morning and having church in my living room. You need to be in the house of God. You'll become indifferent if you're not careful. I got my coffee. Got my new iPhone. Look at here. Got Amazon Prime. Got my Snuggie. Got next Netflix. Got a new car, living in a good house. Heat comes on automatically when it gets cold. Air comes on when it gets hot. Lives that are full of stuff. And you got everything you think you need. But if you don't have the Holy Ghost and fire, you don't have everything you need. Because you can become spiritually indifferent. The curse of blessing in the 21st century, the curse of blessing is that we get so much and it takes so much of our time and we're so indulgent in ourselves until we lose that experience with God. I'm preaching to you tonight on a Wednesday night. We don't need to be spiritually indifferent. We don't need to be self-sufficient. We need to be totally dependent upon God. Here's the second thing that causes spiritual indifference. Distractions. 
Somebody say distractions. Distractions of this world. I read again today, I went to, the, to Mark chapter 4 and read the scriptures where Jesus told the parable of the sower and the seed. And, and you know if you've read any at all, I don't have time to go through it all tonight. But one of those, one of those things that he talked about, one of the seed that, that the sower sowed. If you go read the 19th verse, that's, that's all I'll, I'll get to right now. But he said, he said there was some seed that was choked out. Here's what he said. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word. You can get this and it can be choked and you can get distracted because everything's clutching for you. Everything's reaching for you. I like stuff. You like stuff. You've heard me preach it. I like things. You like things. We all like stuff. But we can't allow stuff to get a hold of us. Because we can get deceived into thinking because we got this or we've got that. We're distracted over here. And you know, the first thing you know, everything is more important than prayer. And everything is more important than church attendance. And, and we get distracted. Uh, you, you, I, hope, I hope you like what I'm about to say. But, and, and most of our, our, our younger families probably aren't here tonight. But you can't let your kids get involved in everything to distract them from the church. The church has got to be the front. The church has got to be the best. You can't yourself get involved in hobbies and things and chores and buying and selling and giving and stock markets and money changers until you get distracted because what happens is you get spiritually indifferent and you become a Laodicea of the 21st century. We can't be distracted. Are you listening to me? You got bills to pay. You got places to be. You got people to meet. It's all about us. Where's your phone? The days of selfies. We're important. Come on now. We're going to take care of good old me. Some folks love themselves. I know that because they post more pictures of themselves and their selfies. They're very distracted. Amen? My wife always tells me, I say, baby, you're so pretty. She said, shut up, Danny. Beauty's in the eyes of the beholder. And every once in a while, some guy will come along and he's got an ugly wife and he'll say, isn't she beautiful? And she'll say, see, I told you. It's in the eyes of the beholder. Well, I said, my behold, my, here's, my, here's what I behold. I like you and you're pretty. So that's my behold. But you know what? We can't get so self-indulgent and so caught up. And say, you know, we got dishes. We got laundry. We got kids to go to practice. We got to change the oil in the car. We got to go to the PTA. We got the meeting over here. And we got the job here. Is everybody with me? We're distracted. We're self-sufficient and we're distracted. And those things are causing, causing, we're causing spiritual indifference. You, you know, the world is caught up in stuff. See, I don't get it. I don't get our world. They want to save the whales and kill the babies. What are we doing? What kind of world are we living in? Feeling numb isn't the absence of feeling, but it's the sensation of feeling too much at once. You know what? Here's what the crowd is getting. They, they just get a little bit of Jesus. If we, you know, if we could just get a little touch on Sunday morning, we soothe our conscience and we feel better. Well, I went up around the altar and prayed today. Here's my question. How much did you pray on Monday? How did you live on Tuesday? Did you come to church on Wednesday? Y'all still love me? You see, there's indicators. There's a few indicators. I got to hurry. There's a few indicators when people are lukewarm. Let me give them to you. You can jot them down if you want to. I don't think they're all in your notes, but here, here's the indicators. I've been living for God for a, a long time, and there are some indicators. Here's what they are. Number one, when you become more concerned with impressing people than living for God, you have become spiritually indifferent. You're more, you're more concerned about what everybody thinks than you are about pleasing him. 
Paul said, do I seek to please men or Christ? If I seek to please men, I'm not the servant of Christ. That's what Paul said. Galatians, go read it. Go read it. Timothy said in the last days that men will be lovers of themselves. When we're worried about pleasing everybody, Jesus said, woe to you when everybody, I'm paraphrasing, when everybody speaks good about you. Everybody's not supposed to speak good about us. He said, you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. The world don't like the church, never has, never will. We're not out to please the world. We're out to please God. We can't please other people. Here's number two. When we are obsessed with life on earth rather than eternity, when everything's for the right now, when we're worried about what we're doing now, what's going to matter this week? Honey, let me tell you, it don't matter to a a, a hill of Kentucky wonder beans what happens to you this week. What happens uh, or what matters is what happens when you rest before this pulpit and a preacher says words over you or Jesus comes for his church. Eternity's more important than the right now. Quit living for the right now. Well, I got to make X number of dollars. I got to catch up with it. I started to say the Joneses, but the Joneses are here tonight. I better leave that alone. That's just an old saying. You know that, Josh. But, you know, I got to keep up with this one. I got to keep up with that one. And, you know, I, 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 boy, I tell you, I, I, Pastor, if it's, I, I'm going to make it. I'm going to get to, I'm going to be that millionaire. I'm going to be the head of this company. I'm going to, what about eternity? I don't care what you're the head of. You better keep eternity in your vision. Amen? Here's, here's the deal. You can't love this world and love God. I got scripture for that. The Bible said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Watch this. For if the love of the world is in you, the love of the Father is not there. Is that Bible? That's in the scriptures. So you got to love eternity. You got to live for eternity. You got to wait on eternity. That doesn't mean we don't occupy. That don't mean we don't get up and go to work every morning. That don't mean we try to have good business or good or good life and treat our family well and be successful. All of that's well and good, but you can't love that and you can't you can't be obsessed with that more than you are living for God. If anything in that measure ever gets in your way, you better kick it out of your way and get your eyes on the prize. Hmm. Here's number three. We rationalize sin now. And we live without truly fearing God. Let me hurry. We, we say this, well, I, I'm, I'm not as bad as they are. And they're, they're, they're in the church. I don't do any worse than she does. You can't rationalize it. Well, I'm not hurting anyone with what I'm doing. You can't rationalize it. Are you listening to me? Selfishness is it's, it's, it's wrong. You can just say, well, everybody gossips. That don't give you license to. You know, we even change the name of sin. We don't call it adultery anymore. We call it adult affairs. We don't call it pornography anymore. We call it adult entertainment. It's kind of softens it a little. We rationalize sin. That's why several years ago, one church decided they'd take blood out of their songbooks. They thought it was just too bloody of a gospel. Honey, the gospel's always good bloody, and you can't rationalize. Matter of a fact, matter of a fact, one church, and I could name it here tonight, I'm trying to be kind, but one church said, we're going to change the definition of sin in this church. You don't change the definition of sin. You can't rationalize it to fit the 21st century. What is sin now has been sin since, since he put it in here. Amen. Here's number four. We believe in Jesus, but we rarely share it with anybody. So, you, you know, when you're, when you're spiritually indifferent, you really don't care about reaching those around you. 
It's just like, you know, I'm going to church. And, hey, I better get up and go, honey. The pastor's going to be calling us. It's, it's not about me. Look at me. It's not about me. It don't matter if I get mad at you or not. It's about him. It's about pleasing him. Amen? It's about him. So when you believe in Jesus Christ and you are a believer and you're full of his spirit and you're baptized in his name and you're living the life of a Christian, you can get spiritually indifferent when you don't share that with anybody else. He called every one of us to be a witness everywhere we go. He said, I'm calling you to be a witness. A witness does nothing more and nothing less than tell what they have seen and what they have heard. He didn't call you to be a judge. He called you to be a witness, and when you are a witness, you share your faith with those around you, people on the job, your family, people you know, people you meet. Number five, I'm hurrying. We only turn to God when we need him, when we're spiritually indifferent. God's like a, he's like the, he's like the ATM machine for some people. Just run by and get a little cash every once in a while. We, we, we turn to God when we need him rather than seek him every day and search for him every day. We seek him sometimes when he benefits us. That's called spiritual indifference. Is everybody with me tonight? We use him as a tool instead of honoring him as God. You ought to worship him every day, not just in the church, but going down the road, there ought to be praises coming out of your mouth. When you get up in the morning, there ought to be praises and worship coming out of your soul. When you go to bed at night, you ought to go to bed praising him. Praise him, praise him, praise him in the morning, praise him in the noontime. Praise him all day long. You know why? Because he's God, and we don't just recognize him as God when we got a problem. We need to recognize him as God every day, all day of our lives. Amen. And here's the sixth one, and I, I'm hurrying. This one, this one you, you, you need to listen to. When you realize that we're really not much different from the world, we are spiritually indifferent. When you go the same places, when you talk the same language, when you watch the same movies, no matter what they are, when you listen to the same music, when you have the same morals, when there's no difference in you and the world, you have become spiritually indifferent. Let, let, let me tell you something. Watch me right here. The church is not supposed to fit in with the world. Are you, are you believe that? We're not supposed to fit in. We're supposed to stand out. Well, you know, I don't want everybody. You know. Come on now. If I had time tonight, I'd take you to the Old Testament and show you those garments of blue on the children of Abraham. I'd show you what the difference was. But let me just tell you, here's what Jesus said. Come out from among them, saith the Lord. Come out from among them, saith the Lord, and I'll be your God and you'll be my people. Come out from who? Come out from the world. When we realize that we're really not much different from the world, we're spiritually indifferent. We need to be praying for the Holy Ghost and fire. Thank you, Brother Roy, for preaching that on Sunday morning. Somebody needs to say, here am I, Lord. What are you trying to say to me today? I need to hear your voice this evening. I need to know what you're saying. And we don't need to be indifferent. We need the heart of God in us. Indifference. Listen to me. Before long, before long, your kids are going to be grown. And when they're not coming to church, it's going to be your fault. Before, don't blame the preacher. I'm preaching my lungs out. I'm telling you, you got to get you got to get God number one. You can't be like the world and please the world and live like the world. Indifference don't just break Jesus' heart. Indifference makes him want to vomit. Go read about Laodicea. Here's what's got to happen. We've got to reignite the spiritual fire. It's got to be reignited. Now, you know and I know that, that there's some things 
there's, there's some things that we all need to do, and that will reignite it. You got to have the Word of God. Amen. You need to read the Word of God. This don't need to collect dust. You need, you need to know the Word of God. You need to pray every day. You need to become a witness. You need to fellowship with God's people. Come on now. You need to give. You need to worship. You need to turn away from those sins. All of those things. All of those things are important. But if I could give you one thing today, if I could give you one thing that would help you to do what we're, we're talking about doing, let your life become such, such a life for God that you do this right here. Every day, you do one thing that requires your faith in your life. You know what the Bible said in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6? It is Im- without faith, it is impossible to please God. You can't please God if you don't have faith. So, so it, 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 read, pray, give, worship, witness, fellowship, turn away from sin, repent, do all of those things. But what would happen if every one of us would, would every day do something that requires our faith? When we get up in the morning, pray for God to open a door for us to use our faith. It may be standing up for something even though you know you're going to be mocked on your job. It may be giving, what, give when it's a stretch for me to give, but I'm going to trust God and give anyway. It's, a, it's an act of faith. I'm losing some of you. It may be going to apologize to somebody and forgiving them when you don't feel like it, and even though they don't forgive you. It's, 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 it may be volunteering to pray out loud at the next meeting you're in. It just takes an act of faith. We don't need to stick our head in the sand like an ostrich and act like we're okay. We need to step out. Reach out to somebody that God puts on your heart and and, and go talk to them about their life and living for God. Expose yourself to something that breaks your heart. Help somebody that's in need. Pray for something that seems impossible. There are no impossibilities with God. But when you step out in faith, attempt something you could never do without the help of God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You got to spiritually engage. You got to get there. You got to pray and search and seek and live and do what God wants. Look, God didn't call us to be the church right here, He called us to be the church out there. All we do here is get refueled to go out there. We spend much more time out there than we do in here. But if I could inspire your faith tonight and have you to pray until the Holy Ghost fire comes and read until your soul is aflame and then go out and act on your faith every day. How long has it been since you since you went to somebody that was in need and said, brother, I'm praying for that in your life. Sister, I want to help you through this situation. I'm telling you right now, you can operate in faith when God gets a hold of you. And you're not spiritually indifferent. This church is a hospital. This church is an infirmary. This church is a place for lost people and hurting people. And the church is not the building. The church is you. 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 Listen to me. I close. One minute. Here was Jesus replied to the Laodiceans. He said, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich in white raiment that thou mayest be clothed that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou may seest that thou mayest see. He said, as many as I love I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. But here's what I want you to notice. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man, somebody say any man. Come on, somebody say any man. Anybody that will hear my voice and they'll open the door. I'll come in and I'll sup with him and he with me. You just got to open the door. Just got to open the door. What would Jesus undo? Stand with me.
he would undo all our spiritual indifference. Don't be like the guy that went to church. They were on the way home. One of the kids, the preacher just got through preaching on ignorance and apathy. The kid leaned up on the back of the seat and said, Hey, Dad, sermon was good tonight. He said, I don't know if it was or not. He said, Dad, you didn't hear the man? You didn't hear what he preached? He said, No, son, I don't care. I don't know, he said, and I don't care. And the preacher just got through preaching about ignorance and apathy. I don't know, and I don't care. Don't be that. Why don't tonight we just say, God, Brother Rory preaching here Sunday, pastors preaching on Wednesday night, pull us close to the fire. Give us something right here. Ignite something in us that we could go out of this church and be a, a flaming fire for the Holy Ghost in this generation. We, we, we can't be satisfied with just singing a few songs and, and a preacher entertaining us. We, we got to get out of that. We got to get out of that. It's not enough just to go to church. Let me tell you something. I went to a church over in Texas. I, I would, look, they had, I'm telling you, everything was to a T. It was perfection. It was perfection. I don't fault. I think that's a great thing. That's good for God. But let me tell you, it's not enough to be perfect. It's not enough to have the music the very best and the singers the very best and the ushers the very best. What I want to know is where is the Holy Ghost? Where is the power of God moving? Is anybody getting healed? Is anybody talking in tongues? Is there a prophecy in your bunch? Is there somebody that believes the five-fold ministry? Is there somebody that believes in the gifts of the Spirit? I'm not, I'm not saying that about that church. I'm just saying everything just seemed perfect. I don't know what kind of church they had. I've never been there. But here's what I do know. I told God this week, God, we want to do our very best, but we don't want to get full of indifference to where we are a Laodicean church thinking we got it all figured out. But we don't really have it figured out. We got to have the presence of the power of God. I counsel of thee to go by gold, try it in the fire. I counsel of thee to go get close to God and go do the things of God and do the ministry of God. You are the extension of him, and he is resting his case in you. Let's do it for Jesus. Put your hands up all over this room tonight. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, on this Wednesday night. Stir up the gift in us, Lord. Stir up the gift in us, Lord. Stir up the gift in us, Lord. Stir it up, stir it up, stir it up. Stir up prophecy, stir up. Stir up the gifts that, that, that you gave us. Stir them up the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom. Stir it up, God. Stir it up. Tongues, interpretation of tongues. Stir it up, God. Do it. Stir it up in us right now. Do it, Lord, and set our souls on fire. Set our souls on fire. Spiritual indifference. I've never seen it like it is right now. It's the eh, generation. How's everything, preacher? Eh. How you doing bringing your family to church? Nah, we, we go every once in a while. We, we get just enough Jesus to keep us happy. We get just enough church to make sure that, you know, we, we will be saved. Really? Jesus said, be careful. You may be wretched and pitiful and poor and naked. You might need more than what you have. I love you tonight. I preach better when I'm preaching to myself. Tonight I'm preaching to me. I want to be what God wants me to be. I want the Lord to stir up the gifts in me. And I pray you would do the same thing. Let him stir it up in you. Father, in your holy name right now, thank you for this church, for wonderful, wonderful people who love you. Lord, it's so easy to get rocked to sleep. It's the devil's desire to, to get us full of apathy 
and indifference. Don't let stuff and things and world, ourselves, get in the way. Stir us, Lord. Stir us in the night. Keep us on our knees in prayer. Bring us close to you. Let us hear your voice. Let us hear your voice. In Jesus' name. And I close with this. The ushers will bring the pants here tonight. We'll let you march to the end of the service. I close with this. The very last thing that Jesus said in the letter of the Laodiceans. Go read it for yourself. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say to the church. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. What the Spirit is saying to the church. He's talking to us tonight. I love you all. I'll see you Sunday morning. We're going to have an apostolic time here Sunday morning. I hope you come ready to worship and praise God. Bring your offering. Bring your offering. There's fans on each side of this room. Bring your offering. Give it to the Lord here this evening. God would be very pleased with that. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. You're dismissed in the fear of the Lord.